you have been brave enough to risk your life to protect the Jewish people back in the time of Hitler? That's a question you'll be asking yourself before tonight's program is over. Then hear the story of an heiress to a Philadelphia fortune who gave it all up to enter the convent and devote her life to helping the poor. Next on Catholic Magazine. With your window on your world, this is Catholic Magazine. Good evening again, everyone. I'm Paul Perillo. And I'm Pat Shelton. Thanks for joining us again this week. Later on tonight's program, we'll hear the brave story of a woman who didn't follow the law, but instead followed her own moral conscience. She risked her life to help the Jewish people back in Nazi Germany. Also on tonight's program, 20 cents. Doesn't buy you much of anything these days, but we'll learn how a group of mail carriers were able to use some extra pocket change to improve a child's life. But first, on October 15th, 292 years ago, a very special thing happened. A saint was born. Sit back and enjoy the story of Marguerite de Uvel, the founder of the Grey Nuns. On October 15, 1701, a young child was born in the Canadian village of Varennes. Her name was Marguerite Dufrost de la Gemerey. At a young age, Marguerite attended the Ursuline Nuns' Convent, and there it was said that she bore the mark of the Chosen. Several years later, her family moved to Montreal. It was here that Marguerite met Francois Duville, and at the age of 21, she became his bride. Unfortunately, this blissful event was to mark the beginning of the bitterest period of her life. Francois did not prove to be the husband Marguerite had hoped for. He rarely spent time at home and was not at her side during the infancy death of their first son. Soon, embittered merchants revealed to Marguerite that her husband was bartering Indian furs for liquor. It was at this time that Marguerite sought courage and strength in God. This saw her through the loss of three more children and the untimely death of her husband. Left with two sons, her husband's gambling debts, and a dishonorable reputation, Marguerite was pressed to open a small shop to sell her sewing and embroidery work. During the next few years, Marguerite became more and more concerned with the plight of the poor. The harsh realities of her life only deepened her faith and allowed her to feel compassion for those less fortunate than herself. In November of 1737, she welcomed a blind and poverty-stricken woman into her home. As years passed, she continued to take in the needy and to serve the poor, all the while financing the education of her sons Francois and Charles. Both had chosen to join the priesthood. Marguerite's charities attracted the attention of three women. Together, the four of them vowed a communal life and to devote themselves exclusively to the care of the needy. As months passed, the group suffered derision and mockery. It was not understood why these women would want to serve the poor. They were accused of selling liquor to the Indians. Passersby hurled stones at them and yelled, Les Sœurs Gris, meaning the tipsy nuns. Later, Marguerite retained the title Les Sœurs Gris, which also means the gray nuns, as a symbol of humility. The nuns persevered and soon took charge of the General Hospital of Montreal. Before long, the hospital was completely renovated and it became a home to the sick, the poor, unwed mothers, and the aged. To gather money for the hospital, Marguerite sowed war supplies. She bought farmland for harvesting, then would sell the crops. She even established a brewery. At the age of 70, Marguerite Duville died in the hospital she had rebuilt. It is said that at the moment of her death, a large luminous cross appeared in the sky above the hospital and was seen by passersby. Over a century later, the Grey Nuns began to accumulate evidence of the saintliness of their founder, and in 1890, Pope Leo XIII declared her venerable. This is the first step in the process of canonization when a person is acknowledged as a servant of God. Marguerite was beatified by Pope John XXIII in 1959. As the second step in the process, she was declared the Blessed Marguerite Duville when she was credited with two miracles. The latest miracle occurred in 1978 as 29-year-old Lisa Normand lay dying of leukemia in a Canadian hospital. Lisa's friends and relatives began to say novenas to the Blessed Marguerite. The disease went into remission and has continued since. On December 9, 1990, Marguerite Duville was ceremoniously canonized as a saint at the Vatican in Rome. This serves as the highest honor of the Roman Catholic Church. Marguerite's charitable spirit spread to America in 1857 when a small group of gray nuns came to Buffalo, New York to work in the Holy Angels Parish. 
This group eventually opened Duville College, which carries on the traditions of Marguerite Duville. I think it's that, that central resourcefulness in the face of need that has been a hallmark of Marguerite and certainly something that attracted me to the Grey Nuns and has kept me here and kept me happy since. Next, we meet a woman who came from a very wealthy Philadelphia family. She gave up all her worldly possessions to become a religious sister and devoted her life to helping the poor. Just south of Florida's Lake Okeechobee, surrounded by thousands of acres of sugarcane, there is the town of Belle Glade. In a shabby, segregated section of Belle Glade, the beautiful dream of a remarkable woman is being lived out. She was a very prayerful woman and one who really believed in divine providence and very committed to the needs of the poor and believed that um, everyone had deserved the best. Just 100 years ago, Catherine Drexel, the daughter of a millionaire Philadelphia banker, founded a congregation of women religious to bring hope to black people and to American Indians. The humble mission of her sisters among the poor of Belle Glade symbolizes how for 100 years her ideal has been worked out in schools and missions throughout the rural South. For example, in New Orleans, Xavier University, the only university founded exclusively for blacks, and in many schools and missions on Indian reservations. From her earliest um, childhood, like her mother would always bring in the poor. They used to have, I don't remember the days, but a couple of days a week they would bring in the, the poor from the community of the Philadelphia area there and the mother would give out clothing or food or, or they really had a, um, they really used to seek out people who had special needs even when she was growing up. Sister Patricia Downs is the director of the Haitian Catholic Center here in Belle Glade. Sister Pat, one of the approximately 400 women religious of the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament for Indians and Colored People, explains for us the ideal of Blessed Catherine Drexel, who was formally beatified by the church in 1988. The Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament were founded in 1891 by Catherine Drexel to address the needs of the American, uh, the Native American and, and black people of our country. What is the relationship between devotion to the Blessed Sacrament and uh, working for Indians and black people? I believe Catherine Drexel felt that the Eucharist is the table where all of us would sit in unity, and there's no separation. So um, the title is to bring all people together to sit at the table, to, to, be, at, to, to, bring, to be together at the Eucharistic table. And she saw the, um, the Eucharist as sacrifice, as life, and that's what she wanted us to do. Our, our um, Constitution is total gift of self, and she felt that's what, well, what Eucharist was about. She felt that all because of our, of the segregated system, you know, in our country and, and, and in the church at that time in 19, 1891, she wanted all of us to be able to sit and be together. We are work oriented. Our kind, we are kind of, we are very work oriented. But she always, we always, uh, we're supposed to spend, like many other groups do, like at least two hours, an hour and a uh, half hour in private prayer a half hour before the Blessed Sacrament and a half hour in private prayer some way. And then spiritual reading in our office and we do go to daily mass. We're asked to go to daily mass, but she felt that our prayer, that only, we would only be effective workers if it came from our prayer life. And she placed a lot of emphasis on prayer. That was a real powerhouse. She believed that and she really felt that our work, our work should always be among the very poor and not, um, not poor with it, I mean, economically poor. And she always felt that we could receive as much, if not more, from the people we work with. She was very strong in um, meeting Christ in every person you met.
Besides Sister Pat, there are four other sisters of the Blessed Sacrament in Belgrade. Together, they staff an after-school program, help with welfare and food stamp forms, operate a hunger pantry, a clothing distribution center, hold prayer meetings, and try to respond to needs as they arise in the community. One pressing need in this poverty-stricken community is health care. Is AIDS a special problem down in this, in Belgrade? It is. Uh, Belgrade has a very high incident of the AIDS virus in the Belgrade community. And there's a number of um, people dying with the disease and a number of people that are um, very, very sick with the disease. And one of our physicians at Palm Beach County uh, Health Clinic has been very outspoken about the disease in our community. And unless there's a uh, turnaround in, in behaviors and a change in our attitude among the, in the community, uh, she claims that the black community will be extinct. It's a very serious problem for us. At this point in time, there are, I don't know what the, the number of incidents are, but most of it's the American community. And it, it seems to be related to the drug use. But we do have a number of Haitian families that are affected by the disease. Housing is also a vital interest here. The housing here is deplorable. We still have public bathrooms. We still have families of uh, five to seven people living in one room with a bathroom at the end of the hallway. And they pay $250, $300 a month for those facilities. This is Covenant Villas. It is a partial answer to Bell Glade's housing problem. Besides providing low cost, clean, and modern apartments, Covenant Villas also provides a nursery and daycare center. It is also an ecumenical effort, bringing together the Mennonite, Baha'i, Episcopalian, and Catholic churches in Palm Beach County. I think one of the, the greatest challenge for us in this community of Belglade is, is that we really witnessed to the love of God for his people, but that we really bring about a sense of shared responsibility that in the Palm Beach Diocese, in the Palm Beach area, the coastal area, it's one of the wealthiest counties in the United States. And we live in the, in the poorest section of the county and also one of the poorest sections in the United States. And I think that's one of our greatest um, uh, witnesses in, is, is the witness of the church and the witness of shared responsibility, that we are one another brother. We are together brothers and sisters, and we, have, we do have one father. And that's very important to me. Sister Patricia Downs left Bell Glade shortly after our interview and has begun to work with the poor in the Haitian rural town of Ferrier in the Diocese of Cape Haitian. But the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament aren't leaving Belle Glade. In fact, they've just committed themselves to an additional five years here. With Sister Pat's replacement, they will still be five and their work will still go on. It is remarkable that a woman who, as a child and a young woman, had every kind of luxury available to her, undertook an ascetical life of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Remarkable that she put her finger on the two most shameful aspects of our history, our treatment of the slaves and their descendants and of the American Indians. With healing hands, Catherine Drexel touched the wounds of the mystical body of Christ in the United States. Her followers share the sorrows of the poor and give them hope. I think Catherine Drexel truly understood that it is much more important to be rich in faith than it is to be rich in money. We'll be right back after these messages. If 
it's news to Catholics, you'll find it in the Catholic Standard and Times. Subscribers already know about the church's new catechism, renewal in the archdiocese, the long-range plan for high schools, even what Mother Teresa thinks about Princess Di. For local, national, and international news, movies, TV, and sports, you'll find your faith's perspective in the Catholic Standard and Times, the official newspaper of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. Call 587-3667 during business hours to subscribe. Set materials for Catholic Magazine provided by Tag Lover Incorporated, serving the Delaware Valley for over 75 years. And by John Wanamaker, fine stores in the Delaware Valley. We welcome your comments, suggestions, and donations and encourage you to write us at Catholic Magazine, St. Charles Seminary, 1000 East Wynwood Road, Overbrook, Pennsylvania, 19096, or call us during regular business hours at 668-9842. Now for a frightening tour back in time as we visit the hiding place where visitors become victims and experience what life was like for Jews during the Holocaust. It was a horrible time when Jews lost their lives just because of their race. The Holocaust of Adolf Hitler during World War II. Millions of innocent people died, but many escaped through a European network of homes and people. This network included Christians, one of whom was Corrie Ten Boom, a Dutch woman who was sent to a Nazi concentration camp for hiding Jews. While the Hiding Place book and movie told her story, now the drama lives in a permanent exhibit. Just off the freeway in Euless, Texas, you can enter this church on the move and be moved back in time in a replica of the hiding place that makes you believe you're really there. Firstly, it frightens them, a lot of people, because it's so real. And uh, it needs to. There's injustice in the world. And people, they say, well, well, let's not talk about it. Well, we do talk about it every day on television. And the movies are all filled with violence, but, but, but it's a fantasy. To the children, they say that's not real. Well, we need to let them know it is very real. So they're impacted by the reality of the cruelty of man. Amidst all the cruelty, there was an underground system for smuggling human life. Corrie Ten Boom's home was a pipeline to Palestine. They were moving the, the Jews from Germany all the way through Europe to Palestine, and hers was one of the stopping points on the way. Well, the special thing about Corrie Ten Boom is that Corrie was a very ordinary woman. If you saw her on the street, you would have said, what a, what a plain person. Jesus, being a spinster, be living 51 years in the same house, taking care of retarded children, taking care of her family, um, not being up with the latest fashions, the latest trends. There was nothing about Corey that typified success. The Nazi threat to those who helped Jews did not dampen Corey's efforts or her spirit. Corey would not um, play ball. One day they brought in a little Jewish baby and her pastor came and said, don't take this baby, you're breaking the law of the land. And she said, and her father said, we will take this baby. And the pastor said, if you do, then you will not be a member of my church anymore because God says obey the law of the land. And besides, you'll, be, you'll, you'll die if you're caught. And her father and her said, we would gladly lay down our lives for the Jewish people if need be. Through clever remodeling, Corey was able to hide Jews from Nazi eyes. Now her room, uh, had a hiding place, which was actually a wall behind the closet, where they'd go under the closet into that little room behind her bed, uh, and it was there she'd hide these people. Where are the Jews? For her work, Corey was beaten and hauled off to a concentration camp. Ultimately, her entire family perished there, but Corey, on a clerical error, was released. Her faith in God took her through the darkest time. We're trying to um, help people understand the greatness of the love of God, because that's what Corey believed. Do you realize that 
the very man who betrayed the family, Corey led to the Lord Jesus Christ, and she forgave him. In Germany, she met him. Exhibit participants are struck by its power. It's very moving, very compassionate to see that these Jewish people, especially Corey Timbu, and what she'd gone through. And it breaks your heart to see that people like her, that we need more leaders like her, that because she's reached out to these people and, and tried to take them in under her arms and protect them through God's love. I thought she was a dynamic woman, just a woman, and it made me want to be more like Corey, that she was so strong. She wasn't strong in Corey, though. She was strong in the Lord. It was her fellowship and her personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that made her strong. The uh, boxcar, I think, was moving because uh, it was dark, it was close. Uh, it was actually moving like you were on a boxcar. And uh, as you were on there, even though you weren't a Jew and you weren't going to concentration camp, those thoughts would go through my mind as I was in there. The hiding place points up an important question. As a Christian, when a race is oppressed, even hunted, can we stand idly by? Would the threat of losing our lives detour us from helping those in need? When do we cross the line of government or even common sense? Whenever a law or a policy of a government compels you to do something that your conscience and your faith tells you is sin against God, you better not do it. You better engage in what we commonly call civil disobedience at that point. Twenty cents today won't even get you a first-class postage stamp. But mail carriers are doing more than delivering the mail. They're putting their extra change together to help children through World Vision. On our next segment of Catholic Magazine, we learn about the Twenty Cent Club. You've probably noticed Twenty Cents just doesn't buy much these days, not even a pack of gum. But a group of postal workers in San Clemente, California, has found a way to stretch Twenty Cents into a life-saving mission. Patty Kelly, a project coordinator at World Vision, recalls. Patty, tell me about 20 Cent Clubs. Well, the 20 Cent Club first came about in the fall of 1985 when a postal worker named Robert Cantu was walking along his route and he was looking at, at the mail that he distributed and he saw a picture of a hungry child and he was moved by compassion and he wanted to do something to help. He then was watching a World Vision TV show and realized and heard that it cost $20 a month to sponsor a child. He wanted to do something. So he, cal he did quick calculations and figured that if he could get four of his friends together to pay a dollar a week or 20 cents a day, that they could sponsor a child together. One day, Bob Cantu came into the swing room while we were taking our break, and he approached us with the idea of if five persons got together and each one donated 20 cents a day, which is the cost of a cup of coffee, we could sponsor a child in a different country who was less fortunate than we were. I bounced it off a couple of people and asked them what they thought of it, and they said, well, maybe it's worth a try. So uh, next morning I came in a little bit early and I wrote down on a blank piece of paper the idea for, uh, I, I didn't know what to call it, a coffee club, a 20 cent club or whatever. And I ended up with a 20 cent club because that's what it costs for a cup of coffee from our vending machine. So I put it up on a blank sheet of paper on the wall and I was hoping I could get three or four people to, uh, to do it. Two days later there were 25 names on the list. And a lot of those names were people that I really didn't expect to be on the list. You know, some of the gruffer people in the office, it just kind of surprised me. We've seen so many pictures of the children from Africa and all over the world who were starving that uh, it was Bob's idea to, for us to come together and support these kids. And uh, this way, it's, we're helping children all over the world. Uh, the children are, a lot of them, are, or most of them are from impoverished families. They need uh, schooling, 
and um, they also aren't really eating healthy meals. And so we go in and feed them, clothe them, and, and provide them with the proper schooling. They, um, they range in age from less than a year to 16 years old, and we have some handicapped children. We have a little girl. Uh, she was just an infant when we started to sponsor her. She should be, I figure, maybe a year and a half, two years old now. Uh, she lives in Mexico City. She has a, I know at least one older brother because he wrote us a letter and thanked us for sponsoring her and said it would make their life a lot easier. People want to do things. They want to help. And this is a small way that they can help without um, any inconvenience and basically just because people are willing to help. And 20 cents a day is, is nothing and it's an easy way to do it. I joined the 20 Cent Club to have an opportunity to help someone who as a, on my own, I wouldn't be able to help, but as a group of five of us, at 20 cents a day, we're able to help a child that uh, is needy. That money buys uh, medical care, food, clothing. Uh, it helps the child's family and, in some cases, the community. They, we send them a picture folder with a picture of their child, and then they can correspond with them. And every year, we'll send them a progress report so they can actually see where their money goes and how it's being used in helping that child. We all have to be responsible. You know, this is one way that we can just be responsible in a little way. Maybe we can do more. You know, maybe this will lead to something else. But it's something that you can do. You may not be able to feed a million children today, but you can, you can feed one. All are invited to the second annual conference on spirituality, Seeds of Hope, reaping the benefits on Saturday, October 16th from 10 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. at St. Andrew's Parish in Gibbsboro, New Jersey. It's sponsored by St. Andrew's Women's Group. Registration is requested. For more information, please call area code 609-346-2731. And the Our Lady of Confidence Retreat for the Handicapped will be held October 5th, 6th, and 7th at St. Joseph's Retreat House in Malvern, PA. This annual retreat will feature Retreat Master Father Francis Peffley. For more information, call area code 215-233-2460. Until next week for Catholic Magazine, I'm Paul Perello. And I'm Pat Shelton. See you next time. Good, Good night. night. Hundreds of women have enjoyed our monthly charismatic prayer luncheons. We gather together at noon on Tuesday, October 12th at Williamson's Restaurant, City Line in Belmont Avenue. Besides charismatic prayer and song, we also have a delicious luncheon. Our next luncheon is Tuesday, October 12th at Williamson's. The cost is just $11. Don't put off this invitation. Just call 215-896-1970 for more information and reservations. See you there.